Ahoy hoy, I'm Plant Walk, and recently I was told that I should go and check out Mud Fossil University because it's full of crazy stuff that I can go ahead and debunk. Of course, it goes without saying that Mud Fossil University, much like PragerU, is not a real university and you cannot get actual qualifications from them. It seems like they use the name Mud Fossil University to make it seem as though there's some semblance of professionalism there, when in reality it's just some guy with wacky ideas. But anyway, I checked the channel out, and one video in particular piqued my interest. It was a video on Crook's radiometer, and the video claimed that physicists cannot explain this toy to you. Now my first thought when I saw that was, where have I heard that claim before? This is a Crookes radiometer. You've seen that before. Obviously, it's been around for ages. Modern science has still not come to a conclusion as to how the hell this works. Don't believe me? Don't give a damn. Go research it for yourself. Ah, Ken Wheeler. Why does it seem like every single person who makes pseudoscientific videos seems to talk about the same kind of things that Ken Wheeler talks about? It's almost like Ken Wheeler's ideas are very pseudoscientific themselves. Because of this, I've decided that today's video is going to be quite different in the format. We're going to look at both Mud Fossil University and Ken Wheeler. This is because Ken Wheeler's video on Crook's radiometer actually goes to show that Ken Wheeler has no idea what he's talking about. And the Mud Fossil University video on Crook's radiometer actually has evidence to support my point about it. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. Okay, my friends, this is going to be fun. Arbor Scientific is a, um, they're showing how this Crook's radiometer works and do, did a fabulous job. Now let me just play it and then I will explain to you what's going on. And I might cut in as I'm going along here. Here goes. This is a Crook's radiometer. You've seen that before. Obviously it's been around for ages. But let me show you something first and then let me explain to you something really important that you, I guarantee you, you do not know. Alright, so they're both going to give us a demonstration about the Crookes radiometer, and then they're going to tell us how it works. I really hope that they both know the full workings of the Crookes radiometer, or this could be embarrassing. Now, before we get into this, scientists don't know how this radiometer works. <laughs> Nobody does at the moment. I do. I understand it, but they don't. Ah yes, the classic, I understand this thing better than every scientist in the world, despite me not having nearly as much expertise in the field of physics. Most people are familiar with the light mill radiometer. You shine light on it, and it spins. The tiny air pressure inside changes to a bit higher on the dark side, which pushes it into motion. I do have to say, this certainly makes it sound as though scientists have indeed managed to figure out how this thing works. Now I'm just using high capacitance, purple, i.e. blue in spectrum light, to sprint up the Crookes radiometer. This is a very low intensity LED, not touching the radiometer. You see it spinning up. Now, let's take a look at blue in spectrum. This is blue in spectrum, the purple was, but this is a, a less intense light source. Nothing. What about green or red? You'll get absolutely nothing. So for Ken Wheeler's demonstration, I'm actually quite skeptical of a few things, because firstly, purple can be made up of either violet light or both blue and red light. Secondly, he hasn't actually done anything to confirm that all the lights are at the same intensity. If I were doing this demonstration, I'd want to be able to show the intensity of each light, as well as the wavelengths that it's emitting. Because in that case, you'd be able to remove all doubt as to whether something screwy is going on. Unfortunately, spectrometers do tend to cost quite a bit of money. So basically here we have to take Ken Wheeler's word that the intensity of light is the same, and that the wavelengths are the right type of wavelengths that Ken Wheeler is reporting. Now, I don't have much of an issue with doing that. It's just that I don't like that there is a bit of uncertainty there. Alright, now he says it pushes it into motion. Let's talk about that in a minute. This happens because the black side heats up faster than the white side. Okay, you see what's going on? He's taking an infrared sensor and he's seeing this is this is emitting light because it's getting heated up. These are not. These are not emitting any or absorbing anything. So it, it started to absorb. Now it's emitting. All right. So think about that. So yes, it absorbs light. 
A lot of that light gets converted into heat energy and there is some infrared radiation emitted. It seems like these people have a pretty good idea about how the Crookes radiometer works. The radiometer is mostly evacuated, which I will prove here by cracking this one open underwater. All right, now what's going to happen is it's, there was hardly any molecules whatsoever in there. In a regular air, there's a bazillion of them. So he's only got this much air in there. It is not a full vacuum, however. See, there's only that much air that was in this whole thing. The Crookes radiometer not being a full vacuum is actually quite important because it turns out that if you make it a full vacuum, it just doesn't work. So that is something to definitely keep in mind. But what most people don't emphasize is that the radiometer is driven not by light, but by heat. And you can illustrate this by pouring some hot water on top. You can even do that by putting your hand on that. It's just the heat of your hand will make that go. He's putting hot water on. Look, he did no light, no, no light driving. Very quickly. Now, watch this. Cold water. Alright, it's... Wait. <laughs> now it's turning around and going back the other direction. Why would cold make it go backwards and heat make it go that way? So the reason why making it cold will make it go backwards is because the black side of the veins actually cool down faster than the white side of the veins. Now when it comes to heating it up, making it spin in the right direction, that is more due to infrared radiation. Because infrared radiation is essentially just light that isn't visible, it can also make the radiometer spin. These are things that are very well understood by physicists. It's not something that is a complete mystery. And right now, I'm going to take a dump on all the ideas that you thought that you understood about modern science. Ken, if I were you, I'd make sure I know exactly what I'm talking about before I do that, just so that I don't, you know, embarrass myself. Okay, the problem is that the physicists have no clue about light. That's, I'm, I'm just being perfectly honest with you. This is pulsed red laser. That is light accelerating. Not supposed to happen. That is the particle that's in the center of the wave, and the wave is a magnetic wave because the particle is a dipole, which means it's a magnet. All right, so there's quite a bit to unpack here. Let's start with the first claim that physicists are just in the dark about light. Physicists do know quite a bit about light because if you are a physicist, you will have to work with light. If you work with lasers, you're working with light. If you're working with radio, then you're working with light. Pretty much all wireless technology relies on our understanding of light being correct in order to work. Even quantum mechanics relies on our understanding of light being correct because if our understanding of light were incorrect, then quantum mechanics would look completely different. A good example might be with polarized sunglasses which only work due to quantum mechanics. Light might be a very difficult thing to understand, but to claim that scientists do not understand light well, that's just patently false. Now the next thing is, with those photos that he was showing there, what are they supposed to mean? There seems to be no context behind them. If you're going to show photos and you claim that it's showing something, then you want to explain how you know that it's showing what you're saying it is. Because anybody can take a photo and then just claim that it shows a thing. And lastly, when he says the particle in the center of the wave, does he mean the photon? Because Photons do not exist in the center of a wave. It's more that a photon is a packet of energy, and that packet of energy is the wave. And of course it goes without saying that a photon is not a dipole, although this again does assume that he's talking about a photon, but he could be talking about anything because he doesn't explain it very well. We think we're so advanced with our quad-core processors, and look, that was number one for two years running on Apple for answering tech support on the MacBook Air. We think we're so advanced. Look at this. This is today. This is not, you know, yesteryear. These are all the theories about how the Crookes radiometer works. There are many, many theories. You see, this simple thing, which is more simple than a damn saltine cracker, modern science, oh, we've got particle accelerators in France, and we've got the Hubble telescope, and uh, we've, you know, we're so advanced. No, we're not. Modern science has still not come to conclusion as to how the hell this works. 
Don't believe me? Don't give a damn. Go research it for yourself. Here's the thing though. Modern science does know how the Crookes radiometer works. Yeah, there are a lot of theories, but some of those theories are incorrect. It's just like there are a lot of theories about how gravity works. There are a lot of different models for the atom. Some theories of gravity are incorrect. Some models of the atom are also incorrect. There are thermodynamic explanations, which, you know, kind of seems logical that, oh, well, you know, if you turn it on the white, you can actually stop it. But if you point it towards the black, it starts to spin up and be like, well, it's heat. You know, black heats up faster. And therefore, that's why it starts to spin in the direction of the applied light. There have been uh, mechanical explanations, especially these particle idiots that think, well, it's actually light beating on uh, the black veins and, you know, pressing it uh, like, you know, pressing against a car or something. Thermodynamic explanation, black body radiations, um, force explanations, um, pressure explanations. So here's where Ken Wheeler shows that he doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Because the black body explanation and the thermodynamic explanation are pretty much the same explanations. The only difference is that the black body explanation is specifically for when it has been cooled down. But at the end of the day, both of those explanations are using the exact same mechanism to explain why it's actually turning. And here's the magnets right here. And there's two of them, one here and one there, side to side. Alright? You can think of it any way you want. Black and white is a positive and negative. The black is gravity, it's the attraction of the white ones, it pulls them together. So this guy is actually really amazing, because it seems like he's a counterpart to Ken Wheeler. Because it seems like both Roger and Ken watched a bunch of university lectures, and what Ken took away from them was, oh, I just have to use a whole lot of big words to make myself sound smart. Whereas what Roger took away is, oh, I have to show pictures and make it look as though I know what these pictures mean in order to seem smart. Where Ken uses word salad, Roger points at pictures and goes, this means gravity. Not only did we accelerate them, we caused fission and fusion at the Venturi. Wait, I thought we were listening to Roger from Mud Fossil University. Why is he starting to sound like Nigel Cheesy Hands? Oops. He is also making less sense than Ken Wheeler here, which is quite the achievement. This device has been around for a long time, this Crookes radiometer. Science has still not figured out how this works. I, however, have, and I'm the first person in the world who has. And the reason I have is because this fat, bald tattoo freak you see in front of you, you know, who was a genius, chess champion in high school and college. You know, I never realized exactly how, um, what's the word, humble Ken Wheeler is. You know, he's just really humble as exemplified by what he's just been saying. I think we need a nickname for Ken Wheeler, which just shows how humble he is. Leave a comment if you have any ideas. Also, I'd like to have a game of chess against Ken Wheeler at some point. I'd probably lose the game, but hey, it would be fun. Translate ancient Greek for fun. I literally wrote the book on magnetism, and I'm the first person to accurately tell you what light is. It's a coaxial circuit. It's not merely transverse electrical and magnetic, but has a longitudinal dielectric. Oh, there's that classic Ken Wheeler word salad. I thought that it was, you know, missing that. But one thing he did say is he did say that he wrote the book on magnetism, like it's the go-to book on magnetism. Now, I just want to ask, how often is that book used in schools or university, or how often is it even referenced? I'm willing to bet that pretty much no academic institute will use Ken Wheeler's book as a guide on magnetism. If you were to find me just one institution that has Ken Wheeler's book as part of the curriculum, I will eat the hottest pepper that I can get my hands on live on stream. But I doubt that's ever going to happen. And that's exactly what CERN and Fermi Lab would like to do and have not been able to do. So what you're saying is you're saying that you're smarter than both CERN and Fermi Lab. It's funny how all these people that haven't actually studied physics are smarter than every single physicist. You've got Roger, who's so smart that he can figure out how a Crookes radiometer works. Even though no other scientist can ever figure out how a Crookes radiometer works, even though science has figured out how Crookes radiometers work.
And you've got Ken Wheeler, who's so smart that he can figure out how a crook's radiometer works, even though no other scientist has figured out how a crook's radiometer works, despite science knowing how a crook's radiometer works. By the way, if you're playing the drinking game of every time I say crook's radiometer, take a shot, well, that's seven shots that you now have to take. Anyway, getting back on track, it seems as though both Ken and Roger think that they're very smart in subjects that they have done zero studying in. And we have done it right here. This black ball, remember I showed you the black and the white, the black and the white? Well, now the black is missing from the white. The white is all by itself. And the black is what's called a sterile muon neutrino. And this is called electron showers. And how can I say that? Well, here's how I can say it. Concern says it, and Fermi Lab says it. The muon neutrino, the black ball, and the white ball, the electron neutrino, when they concuss and cause their radiation, which is their radiation, the muon stays black, the electron turns into a shower. My question would be, how exactly did you get that picture? Did you accelerate particles? Did you smash particles together? How did you get it? Usually these things require detailed explanations that are far more suited to, oh, what's it called? A scientific peer-reviewed journal. They never understood it because they don't understand even the atom. They don't understand the nucleus. They don't understand electrons. They don't understand literally anything, anything about energy. Light slows down, speeds up. There's all kinds of things. You know, this to me has the same kind of energy as tide comes in, tide goes out. You can't explain that. Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miscommunication. You can't explain that. But anyway, I'm pretty sure that scientists understand atoms and electrons and protons and all that far better than you do, Roger. And Mother Nature, she's a really, really simple gal. Okay, she's not an insane cr a hooker on crack, as quantum mechanics would have you believe. So one of the things that Ken Wheeler does quite often is he denies the existence of quantum mechanics. Because to a lot of people, quantum mechanics is quite confusing. However, the entirety of quantum mechanics is all based on measurement and observation. We have waves acting like particles and particles acting like waves. There you've got wave-particle duality. We have particles managing to get through barriers that they shouldn't actually be able to get through. Well, there we've got quantum tunneling. And we've got things like atoms that are changing from one energy state to another. Well, quantum leaps. Instead of admitting that these are actual observations that have been made, Ken Wheeler acts as though the entirety of quantum mechanics is made up. She only understands two co-principles, force and motion, and inertia and acceleration. The entire universe is resistance, capacitance, permeability, magnetism, permittivity, dielectricity. Okay. So the problem with what Ken Wheeler said there is that it's so vague that it doesn't really mean anything. I could say that, yeah, the universe is four things. It's fields, field perturbations, time, and connections between fields. And technically, I could be correct, but it's so vague that it doesn't really mean anything. And when you say something that's so vague that it doesn't really mean anything, then it becomes quite useless. Well, what about that? It means the explanation for this is 100% correct based upon everything that I know about magnetism, which is complete, and everything that I know about light, which is also complete. You know, scientists would disagree with you, Ken, especially AB Science, who has made videos covering all your lectures on magnetism. Ken Wheeler is definitely not a flat earther and will regularly take the piss out of them, but he is still an idiot, so I take the piss out of him. Uh, there's no such thing as a speed of light, it is a rate of induction. The maximum rate of transverse uh, field phenomena through a medium. So this would have to be one of the most accurate things that I've ever heard Ken Wheeler say. Well, kind of. I mean, if people believed me, then they would of course be crazy. Okay, the second most accurate thing I've ever heard him say. Again, kind of. That's because the speed of light isn't just the speed of light. It's the speed at which anything can really go through the universe. And the reason why I added kind of being... That medium, of course, being the ether. There's no such thing as warp space-time. Einstein was incorrect on this. There is no premise to back this up. You see, this is why I don't like Ken Wheeler, because he'll say something that can be interpreted as something that is completely correct. However, he'll always follow it up with something that is just completely incorrect. 
But yeah, he's correct about the speed of light not really just being the speed of light, but also being the speed at which information can propagate. However, he's incorrect about things like light needing a medium. Okay, my friends, short and sweet. The current atomic model is the Bohr model. One gigantic proton and little tiny electrons that float around the outside of hydrogen. Now, Okay, so there are a few things to say about what he said there. If there is one proton then there should be one electron. There can be more or less electrons if it has been ionized, but typically the amount of protons and the amount of electrons will be the same. But the second thing is that the current model of the atom is not actually the Bohr model. It's the Schrodinger model. Yes, the Bohr model is a pretty good representation of the atom, especially for things like chemistry. But the Schrodinger model is the current model that's used. The main difference between the Bohr model and the Schrodinger model is that the Schrodinger model has an electron cloud. This is my model of hydrogen, the dipole electron flood. There is no gigantic nucleus of positiveness. It is all dipoles. However, these dipoles move their polarity into the center causing the dark matter of the dipole to go to the center and the glowy white matter to go on the outside. Dipoles tend to not like being next to each other and being orientated in the same direction. You'd need to have a mechanism as to how all those dipoles can just stay like that and not just turn into one giant bar magnet. Electrons are dipoles. If electrons are indeed dipoles, then what's to stop them all from just sticking together like these magnets? Now, can I demonstrate that? Yes, I can. This would be what you would see. This is a cross section. This is what you would see if you were looking at the core of a hydrogen. And one more electron would want to get in because the, the glowy part would want to get into this black part. Look up tractor beam magnets. I'm going to put a link to it. And also I want you to look up salt experiments. I'll put a link to that as well. And that shows the salt experiment shows the atomic structure locking in at different sizes. And the tractor beam magnet shows this, where the outside particle will come and bang, it can't get in. Because the, these glowy ones say, no, 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 you can't come in. He says, I want to get in to get to that. The, the, the glowy one and it says no you cannot come past us we have enough here now and it says you can stay that far away so i looked up tractor beam magnets and they don't really seem to work for what he's describing here because firstly they seem very 2d not 3d like his model and secondly they have to be held together with something like brass this just supports my point that magnets don't like to be right next to each other orientated in the same direction. Now, the bigger this thing gets, it will attract more and more that want to get into that center. And they will stay at different quantum distances. That's the whole idea of quantum. quantum. You know, you could almost make a drinking game out of how many times Roger says quantum here. Although it probably wouldn't be as bad as how many times I've said Crook's radiometer. But my big question here is firstly, well, what does it have to do with Crookes radiometer? I feel like we've gone way off topic here. But my other question is, how would nuclear fusion work if you want to, you know, combine two atoms together? How does that work in the dipole electron flood? Because I feel like that would be, you know, pretty chaotic to try and combine two atoms together with a whole lot of dipoles and dipoles naturally want to, you know, not stay next to each other orientated in the same direction. If we could cut it in half, what would we see? We would see that. That's all we would see is the dark matter in the center. And that's why these want to hook up with them. They want to be glued together. But the white ones don't want to be next to each other. They will go out to the outside. They'll get as far away as they can and push the black matter to the center. This is what I have found in the experiments. So at least he's kind of considered that they don't like to be right next to each other orientated in the same direction. But that doesn't really solve the problem by saying, oh, they want to be going away from each other. What's keeping them there? And also, because they're dipoles, if they don't want to stay next to each other, what's to stop them from, you know, just turning around and then coming next to each other, eh? The same thing that you, that you saw. See, science, by the way, has no idea 
There's a famous quote from Tesla that goes, if you want to understand the universe, you need to think in terms of frequency and wavelength. And of course, correct on that. And people quote Tesla on that all the time, but they have no idea what the hell Tesla is saying. Well, the quote goes, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, you have to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Now it is true that energy is a pretty big part of the universe. E equals MC squared, right? Oh wait, we don't admit that Einstein had a point here, do we? But I personally don't think that to understand the universe you have to think in a particular way. No, if you want to understand the universe, I would say that you have to follow the evidence. Now, building something and reproducing something, easy. Any chimp can do it. Explaining something is where wisdom and true intellect comes into play. Well, the thing is, explaining something correctly is a little bit more difficult than just pointing a light at something going, oh, this is how it works. No, you have to have a hypothesis. You have to test that hypothesis. You must account for confounding variables to make sure that that's not impacting it. Once you have done that, then you can be fairly confident that your explanation will be correct. See, anybody can observe phenomena, like the idiot Einstein. He won a Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effects. Well, Einstein won a Nobel Prize. Yeah, you know what that means? That means one idiot, moron, um, tried to explain something, and that explanation was accepted by a lot of other people who patted him on the back and gave him a Nobel Prize for something that he didn't, deser uh, didn't deserve. Well, the thing is, Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't just suddenly accepted by people there were criticisms that were levied against it. It's just that relativity has been tested multiple times since its inception and has been found to be a pretty good explanation of how the universe works. Correct. Observations, which are reproducible, does not have any bearing on the explanation for that phenomena. But the explanation does have an impact on what we would expect to see. If we expect to see something and that does not line up with what we actually see, then obviously there is something wrong. If it does line up, then hey, maybe we've gotten something correct. This is a huge error in science. Huge error in science. Academic hubris is so... Where's your PhD at? Your PhD, you're saying you know more than people have a P... You know what a PhD in peer-reviewed means? PhD in peer-reviewed means that you kiss a bunch of assholes of people above you, you agree with their crap, and all those people did was agree with crap before them. It is a giant circle jerk of stupidity, ignorance, and hubris. Oh, I see that Ken Wheeler is doing the tell me that you don't understand peer review without saying that you don't understand peer review challenge. So what peer review actually is, is you have your paper and you want to publish it. Then people also look over your paper to make sure that there are no errors with it. If the peer review process manages to catch those errors, then your paper will not get published unless it gets revised. The way this device works is the same way the photoelectric effect works. It was discovered that there's a certain threshold frequency of light that caused uh, the buildup between the cathode and the anode of electrostatic buildup. Okay? Now Einstein's explanation for that was 100% incorrect, but since I understand exactly what light is, and the way this works, and the way, the reason why the higher capacitance light towards the blue end of the spectrum, but a little further than the blue, towards the purple here, why this begins to spin up only, this is the low, low emission LED here, why it only begins to spin up with the higher capacitance and never with the red or the green, or even the blue, because this is low output, is because what is actually going on is that there is an electrostatic buildup and a discharge against the medium. It is no different than a magnetic repulsion. It took him so long there for him to actually explain how it works. The whole time I was like, yeah, how does it work, Ken? Yeah, how does it work, Ken? You've been saying the way this works for quite a while now. How does it work, Ken? But the problem with Ken Wheeler's explanation there is that it does not account for when you cool it down. If the photoelectric effect were really responsible for the Crookes radiometer, then cooling it down would not make it spin in the other direction. This is because the photoelectric effect works due to light and not due to heat. So if it were the photoelectric effect, there'd be no mechanism for it to spin in the opposite direction once it is cooled down. So that is Ken Wheeler's explanation. How about Roger's explanation? All right, so we know the Crookes re reacts to light. 
because light is heat. No, Roger, light and heat are two different things. Yes, they are both two different forms of energy, but they are both two different forms of energy. It has heat to it. It reacts to heat of your hand, it reacts to heat from hot water around it, and it reacts backwards to cold. This is the key. That's the real one, the tricky one. Now, why does it spin? Why does that thing spin? The black spins away from light, so the light comes in, the black goes around. Now, why does heat spin? Why does heat do it? If it's not, light is not necessary. Heat does exactly the same thing as light. So is light heat? Well, we could think about it. Well, heat makes it spin due to infrared radiation because when things are hot, they will emit infrared radiation. Why does cold reverse spin? Is cold reverse light? Think about that. I really hope that Roger here isn't a flat earther that goes on about cold moonlight. That would be very disappointing, although not unsurprising. Why is the gas density critical inside that dome? Why does it have to be exactly a certain place in order for it to spin? Otherwise, if there's no gases, gases in there, it won't spin at all. If there's too much gases in there, it's regular, like our, the atmosphere out here won't spin. So you have to have almost nothing, as you saw, where it filled up with water when he opened it underwater. I will admit that I do not know exactly why the gas density is critical. Although, I can hazard a bit of a guess. My guess would be that if there's too much gas, then that will absorb a lot of the energy from the light. That is a guess, I cannot confirm that. If anyone does actually know why, then please do let me know in the comments. So what I'm going to do is let you think this over. I know why that thing spins, and I know why it spins backwards, and I know what cold is, and I know what heat is, and I know what these particles are, and I know what electrons and muons and electron neutrinos and photons are, and I know what protons are constructed of, and I want somebody to speak to me about it, because I am showing evidence. I'm not showing you just guesses. The problem, Roger, is that your evidence lacks the context to even be considered evidence. As I said earlier, anybody can take a photo and then claims that it shows something. The context is what is really actually important. So, think about what you think causes that thing to spin, and why does it spin backwards when it's cold? Think it over. Next video, I will explain. It's very, very simple. I am very disappointed that he didn't show it in this video because I am not willing to respond to another video within this video because this video is already over half an hour long. And to be fair, a lot of that was because Roger was going on about atoms for some reason. I still don't know why he was going on about atoms. And if I don't hear from Fermi Lab or Lawrence Livermore or CERN or JPL or any of those people, and I won't, it's an admission of that they're, they're just wrong. Well, no, it's not an admission that they're wrong. If you were to say, if I don't hear back from NASA about the Earth being flat, then that's an admission that they're wrong. Do you think NASA is going to get back to you about the Earth being flat? No, of course not. They've got more important things to do than respond to crazy people on the internet. That's just an admission they're wrong. If they won't look at something like this, and, and which could help us because we get free energy. I've been showing this for six years now how to get free energy from this interaction. Oh, he is really taking the Nigel Cheese route, isn't he? Free energy now. Oops. I think that is enough from both Ken Wheeler and Roger from Mud Fossil University. This is actually a video where Ken Wheeler came off being more sane than usual, despite him being completely wrong. Although, let's be honest, that is probably completely due to the inclusion of Roger. But with that, make sure you do all the good things to help my video on the algorithm. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and make sure you join my Discord. And if you do want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. Links should be in the description. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching. And Ken, just end up the video for me, please. Photon idea is an abstraction from misunderstanding the coaxial nature of light, which is a refraction of compression along the dielectric. Yes, and that of course is just a compound.
ether perturbation modality, because that's all a field is, and I define that in my definition. Counter space. perturbation modality, because that's all a field is, and I define that in my definition. Space. 